the fun part is that in IIT, literally every damn student is a Chatur or a Funsuk Mangru, right? So every batch, every branch has, you know, tens or twenty or thirty such people who are geniuses, and they all think that every other person is a genius. So the beauty of uh, an institute like IIT is that you are always the dumbest person in the room. Our initial interns that we had hired, we used to make them sit in the IIT Bombay library. So <laughs> we literally had no idea about what the method to this madness is. But last year we closed that around 21 crore and hopefully this year we'll cross 30 crore. So uh, yeah, I mean the growth has been uh, tremendous. A lot of the work is not something that I believe can simply be done with prompts. For example, thinking about a brand and what it should stand for, how it should position itself. This is not something that I foresee that an AI will tell me uh, in the next few years. So if you have a hyper-intelligent AI who understands everything and can personalize the way in which you learn and resolve your doubts and meet you over there, that could really change the game for education. They have just in two words summarized. So Sanskrit also follows maybe the principles of minimalism in those quotes where you can say so much by saying so little. And we believe that that is the ultimate form of sophistication and that's a very critical skill that people should learn. So today's guest at the Conversations Cafe podcast edition uh, that we have is a fantastic uh, individual who believes in the concept of minimalism. He is an IIT Bombay graduate and during his time at IIT Bombay, he came up with this Facebook page that he thought can be converted into a business. And today, that business uh, gives him a 25 crore to 30 crore revenue. How did he do that? What exactly are his principles in life? What are the kind of things that he did that made him believe in the power of minimalism? And what you can learn from minimalism is what we have discussed in this very fantastic podcast that we have shot with Sahil Vedya. If you're liking the Conversations Cafe podcast, make sure that you like these videos so that it helps us with the algorithm and do share it with friends who you think might find it uh, valuable. And subscribe to the channel and keep watching this video. The podcast starts in 3, 2, 1. Sahil, uh, you know, let me just first get straight to it. How influenced are you uh, by this documentary that came on Netflix? It's called The Minimalism. And how interested are you or how much of a follower are you of Marie Kondo or Matt Devella, who are the big names, as we call it, in the world of minimalism? So yeah, uh, not so much the other two names, but I did watch that uh, documentary on minimalism and I, I tend to agree with it quite a bit. I think that's one of the foundational principles of my own life also. So it's not just that this is a business and uh, as a person I'm completely different. Actually minimalism is the way I operate also. And I strongly believe that a lot of problems in life can be solved if you just focus on what really matters. The interesting point is I didn't know about it when we started. I discovered that documentary much later. I believe it was released also much later. Yeah, no, uh, it was uh, released in 2015. So oh, it? incidentally, it was the year when you actually built your yeah. company also. Yeah, so I, I'll tell you how I knew about them was that when we got that name, right? And actually our name has been a very big selling point also. People love that name. A lot of international brands also love that entire positioning and tend to work with us because of that. So. When we got that name, we realized that there's already someone by a very similar name that's an extra S yeah. with an extra S and yeah. that always used to mess up with our S ranking. Yeah. So that's how I got to know about them. Where do you stay in Bombay? I stay in uh, Pawai. Pawai. And uh, how big is your uh, apartment or flat? It's tiny. It's really tiny. The Bombay standard uh, flat maybe six, seven hundred square feet. Right. Is this a conscious choice that you had done or is this the rent of the Bombay that has restricted you? Yeah, I mean, if you even look at my place, there's not much over there. Uh, in fact, now that I'm married, there's probably a few more things that are there. But uh, if you looked at, if you would have looked at how I used to live as a bachelor, my room used to be really clean, spick and span. Wow. Nothing. I, I mean, the only thing uh, that exerts a presence in my room would be the books because I have lots of them. Right, and we're talking about IIT engineer who was in IIT Bombay who says that his room was clean and he had a lot of books. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so in IIT, I didn't have books. and uh, But yeah, in IIT, our room was pretty clean. So my roommate also used to be a very clean and, uh, you know, a conscious guy. 
So yeah, it was a big paradox. You know, you never find those clean rooms in IIT, and you you got that right. But yeah, for some reason, I used to have a knack for order and keeping things clean and just not accumulating a lot of stuff. How was the growing up years for you? You know, where were you? I mean, were you always in Bombay? What was the kind of growing up years like for you? And what have you seen in life that has made you believe in this principle that you do? A lot of things influenced me, but uh, probably. I I I never been into fashion as such uh, so I never was into getting into a lot of grooming or buying a lot of clothes and probably that also comes from my father who is also an IITian yeah. uh, so he's also eccentric that way and I think that has passed on to me and he always defended me when I didn't want to get groomed or didn't want to buy extra clothes or put in an effort to look nice uh, maybe that <laughs> definitely played a role but then over the years I probably also realized the futility of consumerism and accumulating things and thankfully i think i realized early on that these things are they don't really lead to a real happiness so uh, now i'm pretty averse to the idea that you know buying things and running after things can actually get you happiness but yeah, i think these influences of reading more about you know what happiness truly is and how do you get that and that natural upbringing where i realized that accumulating things doesn't really lead to anything probably that influenced uh, the way i looked at uh, things was it the fact that your father was an engineer that made you also think that you know that is a kind of career that i also want and that's the kind of study that i also want to do yeah so very early on uh, in my household there was this talk that iit is the best institute in the country and since i was a very studious and academic kid Uh, that naturally became uh, part of my wish list and how was the uh, iit days uh, there once you get in then you absolutely get to know that you know for the 4 years or the 5 years i don't know how much time you took you are stuck here there are two options or the choices that you have one you enjoy the kind of things that happen there and second you you know drag yourself through the days and then wait for the day when you will graduate and then you'll start something of your own or do something that you wanted to do right so uh, it it was never the latter uh, of course when it comes to uh, academics it was in a way the latter because uh, very early on i realized that uh, this is not something that i am really passionate about uh, and there is a bit of a paradox here because uh, you know maybe it's uh, maybe you don't find something very interesting when getting your grades depends on understanding it really well you know when you're measured on how well you understand it maybe that naturally leads to that mindset where you start giving up because Uh, you know, it's a very competitive thing. Uh, I don't know how much influence that played in this journey at IIT, but very early on, I realized that maybe this is not my cup of tea. Like millions of other engineers who sign up for engineering and then realize that it, they're not cut out for it. It all it also happens because uh, I guess these exams, these competitive exams like IIT, JE, they of course they are one of the toughest in the world. Uh, but probably they they gauge people on their raw smarts and intellect and not. Uh, so much on their scientific orientation or probably on the fact that will this kid really enjoy being a part of uh, the scientific community or you know being a part of science as a whole so probably they just gauge raw smarts and maybe that's why the smartest people in the country end up in iit but they are not necessarily inclined towards the scientific process and research and all which is why probably single digit percentage of students actually pursue a career in research and as you see most of the kids get into either startups or finance or consulting i believe that uh, maybe because they check more on that uh, uh, on raw smarts instead of scientific uh, temper and capability maybe that is why so few people actually pursue uh, science so my life was actually in that bracket only uh, but the only difference was most of the people are very talented and know what they are going to do and they build a very good resume and they get very good grades i had none of that i was i was totally clueless and i was just meandering around with creative pursuits with absolutely no idea about what i want to do so was there a chatur in your iit as well or uh, were, were you the funsu gangudu of the iit bombay <laughs> you know i laughed at it because i was the exact opposite i was probably the the other two hmm. farhan and raju always at ah, the okay, last okay. yeah <laughs> so uh, and the fun part is that in iit literally every damn student is a chatur or funsu gangudu right so every batch every branch has you know tens or 20 or 30 such people who are geniuses and they all think that every other person is a genius so the beauty of uh, an institute like iit is that you are always the dumbest person in the room 
and uh, but some people of course in some aspects are smarter than the other i always universally was the dumbest person in the room <laughs> and uh, uh, probably that also sort of helps you uh, grow much more because you're always surrounded by people who are so much smarter than you and not that i pursued uh, scientific interests with them but uh, yeah that that was the situation in iit a lot of times uh, what happens is people branch out because they do a lot of things on campus and then they realize that this is my true calling where you also engaged in these kind of what we call the extracurricular activities right so that's a good point actually i was dabbling much more with everything else than with academics and uh, not in a planned way that you know maybe dabbling in 100 things will ultimately help me figure out uh, something so it was not a grand strategy that i was deploying i was just randomly engaging in different creative pursuits in college so i got into drumming i was a lot into the wow. music scene at iit nice. used to play at a lot of events i was a lot into writing so if you remember back in the day kora was uh, just uh, booming up booming, yeah. so mm-hmm. so i was writing a lot on kora i used to run a facebook page in iit where i used to write about the experience of iit students and uh, i used to make a lot of memes so i was a lot into and uh, yeah on facebook i used to write a lot of one liner jokes and all which would spread a lot in the campus and that used to give me a lot of uh, encouragement so yeah these random creative pursuits always kept me occupied but not that i did it with a ultimate plan in mind uh, they were just happening uh, and in hindsight i believe that they did help me figure out ultimately uh, the path that i was supposed to take so but uh, did you not uh, think of doing an masters degree after you were done with your uh, it's did you not think of going the next step which is usually i am not i'm saying usually because a lot of people think that yaar yeah, it karke fir wo engineer ki naukri nahi padegi Oh, it's such a management kar lete hain and then they get into you know the pursuit of another higher institute which is the iims there is another cutthroat competition that happens and then they get through and then they learn for another two years did that not happen for you or was it a conscious choice that you took so i had a five year course by the way so it was not that i failed any year and i had to repeat yeah that was a question <laughs> that i actually wanted to ask you but i did not know how to put it <laughs> no no you can you can put it directly because there's a good chance i would have failed so there would be no offense in that question but yeah i had a five year course where one year was uh, so so you have a integrated course where you get a btech as well as an mtech in five years okay. instead of six so I, iit has a lot of these dual degree courses so i had a dual degree course so by the end of five years i also had a masters which means nothing but i did have one uh, so yeah the fortunate thing was that we started the minimalist in um, when i was in when i was entering my fourth year or rather when i was entering my fifth year so we started the facebook page when i was in my fourth year and it actually started as a company in uh, the 5th year okay. so by the time uh, it was time for the placements to happen or for me to make a choice about if not placements then what is it an mba by the time that time came we already had a team of you know 15 20 people oh. working with us and we had clients and we had cash flows and profitability and all that so fortunately i never had to confront that choice and fortunately we had our parent support also so it never came to that point but yeah when before we had started when i was ending my third year and which is the time when people start really thinking really about, thinking about these it yeah. stop wasting their time and <laughs> take a hard look at what they how they have wasted the last 3 years that is when i remember there was one conversation with my parents and they also asked me do you want to do an mba and frankly it would not have been a bad choice if i had nothing else maybe i would have uh, opted for that or college placements but were you consciously building a uh minimalis as well at that time when you knew that you know there's a facebook page that i've created i don't know what the future will look like uh, there are a lot of companies that are also coming in there are a lot of of my friends who are getting good jobs uh, from campus what am i doing was this feeling not there present while you were at it yeah it seems very surprising but uh, i wasn't really acting on those fears i was just loitering away my time and i started the facebook page when i entered my fourth year and my placements would have happened in fifth year mm-hmm. so i still had a bit of time right. to figure something out yeah. so i had taken an internship at the end of my third year my co-founder chirag had also taken an internship we were traveling together to those internships and it was in the course of those auto rides that we started discussing this idea and we actually came up with the idea of starting a facebook page and uh, that was when we actually did it in august 2014 we started that page and we called it the minimalist uh, and he actually had to reject his placements uh, and pursue this full time so it was a much bolder decision for him 
I still had a year to go. If this didn't work out, I could have just resorted to the option of sitting for those placements. But uh, when we were building it, it was he who had to take that tough choice, uh, which he did, and um, we are very fortunate that he actually decided to do that. So yeah, but on my part, I was just you know building it, and you know we were just seeing. Let's see where this goes. Tell me about the auto story of building on Facebook. Like we are talking about the time when Facebook was still relevant. Yes. People were still using it, and the community that you build on Facebook was you know monetizable at that point. Even today, it is, but it has gone down drastically, and people have moved on. If you're taking a bet like this, it's a huge bet, right? You're not going to get salaries. You're not sure whether your company will exist after a year or not. And it's a digital business we're talking about that a lot of people have not done. Right. So the blueprint is not there, right? So what were the kind of conversations you were having among each other, which was you know challenging yourself also or your beliefs or thoughts at that time? Actually, uh, so when we were starting out, uh, so it's true that we didn't know that there is a blueprint, but typically there are a lot of services business. So it's I mean, there is a formula to cracking and scaling also, but of course we were not aware of it because leave alone starting a company, we had also never done a job. Yeah. Uh, but when we were starting, it it was just a very serendipitous uh, idea, and we were just seeing where it goes from one point to, to the other. And you're right, Facebook was on its uh, decline actually right. back then. Right. And uh, in fact, if you have any Gen Z viewers, they must be thinking, what kind of an uncle am I <laughs> <laughs> watching? So we got a lot of traction initially. Of course, we had to hustle a lot and work hard for it. But the initial appreciation that people had for the kind of content we were creating, that was uh, very good and that was very encouraging. So that pushed us to work harder and try to build an audience. And I believe I've always been a person who tries to hack his way to build an audience. No, not that I've built really large millions of people you know, in my audience, but uh, even when I was uh, running that small Facebook page in college, I was trying. I tried to create three, four thousand uh, followers for that. Then, you know, when Minimalist started, we tried creating a following. So this hacking. Even now, I am trying to build a newsletter. So that hacking mindset was always there. And that once we started, a few brands started noticing it. And back in the day, there were a lot of content aggregators on Facebook itself. Yeah. So there was this one such page. I don't know. You might not know it, but it's called the Logical Indian. So yeah, they, yeah, you must have heard of it because they were huge. They had a few million followers and they started sharing some of our very hard hitting content and that acted as a very good growth hack. So yeah, so we gradually got over 100k followers and once that point was reached, a lot of brands were also naturally reaching out to us saying that if you're doing this for fun, why don't you really work with us? And that was the first inkling of validation that there is a need for such services. So maybe a business can be built out of it. So we had this at the back of our minds, but there was never a concrete idea. But when clients started calling us, we realized that yeah. What was the first client story? What was the first uh, you know order that you got that made you feel that wow, I've never thought that this can also be done. Right. So there were a few seniors from the IIT network. They were starting a company. Um, today it's called Care24. It recently got acquired. So they had reached out because they were. They had just raised some capital and they wanted to build their brand identity and uh, social media and all of that. And that was the first time we actually got some business. And then they were, it was followed by a few more, you know, these uh, tech startups which had just raised a series A. And those few projects we just did uh, in, I think, in the beginning of 2015. And we used that capital to, you know, just get an office. And we, in fact, we had to get an office because we tried hiring a few designers. And they asked, where is your office? Mm -hmm. And that is when we realized, that, okay, we need an office. Okay. You can't just hire people like that. In fact, our initial interns that we had hired, we used to make them sit in the IIT Bombay library. So <laughs> we literally had no idea about what the method to this madness is. So it okay. all happened very organically. Uh, and, and we had to learn by stumbling each uh, part of the way. And so was your content. I think uh, you never spent money on performance marketing Nothing. as well as Zero. you mentioned that because you had your Because we never knew yeah, right. all of this can be done. And uh, in fact, when we were building, there was nothing called creator. Today, creators, influencers are everywhere in the last four, five years. But back in the day, there was nothing called creator. And in fact, on Facebook, having such a community was also a, a very, very, uh, that, that was a huge number, 150k. But we were oblivious to all of this. Sometimes, it's it's best to just go with the flow and let ignorance actually help you because the the more you know and plan and strategize maybe it puts uh, you into a, a situation where there's too much pressure to do all the right things but that's rarely possible in fact we must have made uh, 100 blunders in our initial years but it's, it's uh, that you know when you don't know is when you can break the rules right and you can do it efficiently so right. since we don't know how these things worked in the other agencies 
uh, we were able to actually build something of our own in a unique way. Uh, you know, in fact, if I knew how tough this business is, how competitive this business is, maybe I would never have started it. Right. <laughs> so, so that ignorance is uh, often very, very. That's helpful. what I was getting into. You know, Bombay is filled with these agencies, and you have cutthroat uh, competition. Yes. Probably today also there are oh, ten different agencies that probably uh, gives the same kind of service that you do, right? How did you make sure that you survive as something uh, as somebody who have never raised? any funds, we have never gone to a VC, right. has always been a bootstrap company and it's been almost what 7-8 years eight that years, you guys yeah. are up and running. How do you make sure that this dice keeps on rolling with so much competition? Right, yeah I mean it's a really tough thing. Um, in fact when people ask me today, when new uh, people starting agencies ask me today, that's the same thing that I tell them that you know you have to have a really solid differentiator and a reason for people to come to you. Because otherwise, there's too many people doing the same thing. When we started, we were since we were digital natives and we had cracked this, you know, content piece, which we, which was really unique. That actually helped us attract a lot of clients. And to this day, people remember us for that particular thing, right? So, so you have to have something that creates a pull. And once you have generated that pull, of course, it's about how well you serve them and how well you scale your organization with people management, building the right leadership levels and creating the right structures. So, but yeah, that initial reason for any client to come to you versus some other company has to be there and that has to be rooted fundamentally in the business proposition. And for us, it was, uh, you know, thought provoking design and minimalism and whatnot. How much was an IIT uh, Bombay grad making in the first year of graduating? Maybe back then, maybe 8-10 lakhs. 8 10 lakhs. Yeah. And how how much were you making uh, working at Minimalist in the first yeah. year after so, graduating? Um, I mean, until the first few months, we didn't take any salary. But after that, maybe 20k a month. So 20k a month? Yeah. Wow. And what did your father and mother say? I mean, both were doctors and engineers, and they've sent their son to IIT Bombay, uh, an institute that probably lakhs of people want to go to. Right. How, how did you come back home and tell them that, you know, for a few months, this is what we are drawing as salary? I was personally very fortunate because my parents always supported and they never had these questions. And uh, like I said, you know, I started in my fifth year, so I was already earning before graduating. And not that, uh, you know, the uh, salary increased a lot because initially we were still struggling and trying to build the base. But yeah, when it comes to other people who probably would miss out on opportunities because of this fear or because of this pressure, you know, I would say that uh, this is the early investment that you're making. It's called sweat equity. I mean, you are not just investing capital, you're also investing your own time in building it. And of course, the returns are outsized. You know, today people chase stocks or assets for 15-20% return a year. But this kind of investment, if it works well, it can net you, you know, in three-digit percentage uh, per year. So, I mean, that investment, I believe, is worth it. And secondly, you know, the natural question for people might be that, but what if I fail, right? Then what? I, I've earned nothing and I failed. But you know, the main reason why I was also really enjoying it and never thinking about the money. In fact, that's interesting. I never ever thought about how much I am making or how much I am saving or how my batchmates would be earning much more is because I was learning new things. I was picking up new skills and picking up things that I knew that I'll only be able to do if I run a company. And those skills are actually what your true value is, right? When you, even if your venture fails, there would be 10 others who would actually value the skills you have picked up in building a company right. and failing because you realize what doesn't work. Uh, so I think those skills are very, very valuable and you know, even today in the age of AI and all of that where a lot of things can get automated, your skills and what you really understand about how to build things is the ultimate currency. So not what you make every year, but what you're building which can give you manifold long-term returns. Absolutely. I'll come to the AI bit, but first I'll come to the manifold bit. How much of a revenue is your company making now? How much of that growth uh, has happened from that time when Said was actually graduating from IITB with a salary of 20,000 per month? <laughs> the last year we closed at around 21 crore and hopefully this year we'll cross 30 crore. So uh, yeah, I mean the growth has been uh, tremendous and that's what I was saying that when we first started, probably in the first year we might have made uh, less than a crore. So that and in 7-8 years it has actually gone 30x. So so that's the kind of return that is possible and th there's no investor capital over here, right? It's come. In fact, it was a bootstrap from hell because we ourselves had no money. So bootstrap means you invest your own money, but what if there's no money to invest? 
So we I literally had uh, zero rupees because we were broke students uh, who used to take money from others to eat at the canteen. So we had literally no cash, and like I told you, what we did was we did a few projects. We took that money and reinvested that into paying the deposit for an office or paying an intern. And it was always reinvesting the company's capital to grow. And how big have you guys become? How big an office <laughs> there is, right? In fact, uh, you know, so when we were pre-COVID, our office was pretty swanky and huge, and it was a hundred seater and all. But after COVID, now we have moved to hybrid, so now it's not like as big as earlier. Uh, but yeah, the team is 170 plus right now. So it's a big team, but geographically spread out, and uh, it's you know hybrid working, so you won't see 170 in one room. Super. Uh, let's let's talk about the AI bit now that you mentioned, uh, where you said that it's your skill and the craft that matters, uh, and not the kind of machines that are kind of coming in and overpowering a lot of th things. Does it scare you? It's very hard to predict what's going to happen, so I'm not even going to attempt that. Uh, and if anyone has uh, rock-solid predictions, then you should doubt that because nobody knows how technology moves and how it impacts I'm sure society. Your, the technology at your time when you were in IIT was different than what it is today. Very different. In mm -hmm. fact, people very easily give hot takes on AI and how it will change everything. But I mean, it, that, I, I don't know how people develop that much of conviction or certainty. My thought is veering in both directions. So one is that I feel that specifically when it comes to what we do for clients, a lot of the work is not something that I believe can simply be done with prompts. For example, thinking about a brand and what it should stand for, how it should position itself, truly understanding why people buy the competition's product and what can you do to really position yourself differently. This is not something that I foresee that an AI will tell me uh, in the next few years. I could be wrong, but at least this part of doing the actual thinking is something that I believe is probably the long, it's, it's a long time away. Of course, the, there's a lot of execution work that happens and the base uh, effort that goes into that execution, yeah, that might get automated. So yeah. we are also upscaling our, our teams and we are introducing a lot of creative technologists in the organization uh, whom we have hired with the express purpose of being ready for this change. Whenever a change happens, at least you should be open to that change. Openness is the core value at the minimalist and we are trying to adapt to this new reality. Because resisting it is pointless. So, I mean, even if there's an amazing tool that does everything for you, ultimately someone has to start learning it and ad adapt it into their systems, which itself is a time-consuming process. You know, when like electricity came for the first time, it's not like it changed the game in a few years. It took probably 40, 50 years for factories to start retooling and start using electricity. Absolutely. Of course, the pace has accelerated much more, but that example shows that when something new comes, it's not that it changes everything overnight. So at least people need not worry that tomorrow I'll be totally displaced. Of course, the pace of change is fast, but humans will take time to adapt and that gives all of us enough time to sort of start learning and see how we can upscale. We are also trying and making this adoption as easier as possible. We have a course on AI and prompt engineering. Uh, people who are interested in the course can uh, check out the link in the description. There is a lot that is happening in the world of AI and we are trying to help you out with that. With respect to AI, uh, Zahil, I also have another question for you, which is going to be the worst thing possible if we have a very high adoption rate of AI in India, right now where we are standing. And what is, in your opinion, is the best thing that's going to happen if the adoption rates are higher? Right, so the utopian scenario is that it will not displace many people. In fact, so there is something called Javon's paradox. So th this guy was an economist in Britain and people had felt that, you know, if uh, the steam engine efficiency is improved with new technology, then we'll use lesser coal and that's not going to be an environmental issue. But this guy, Javon's, I think he said that Actually, if it gets more efficient, we'll use more of it. Because now, for example, if you can get electricity with lesser input, you'll create much more electricity so many more people can use it, right? So it's not like a new technology that is very productive will displace people. In fact, everyone will start using it to 10x our productivity rather than reduce the number of people working. So the best case is something of this uh, style where instead of replacing people because we have these hyper, hyper productive AIs, we actually augment people with these AIs and the overall productivity goes by 10x or 100x and that leads to much better outcomes. I also feel that um, education can be personalized since you guys are also in this space. I feel there's a huge opportunity because as a learner, so I'm a, I, I learn every day, I read so much, right? And I try to pi pass it on through my newsletter also learning machine. So what I realize as a learner is every time I read a complex concept and I have a very specific doubt, 
I want someone to explain to me the resolution of that particular doubt, which may not come into the minds of other students, but that's just the way I am thinking, and that's one entanglement in my mind, which an expert, a very very good teacher, can actually resolve. But the problem is, if I am reading a book, I don't have a direct line with the author. Yeah. Even if I do, he might not be a very good teacher. Many times these academics are very good thinkers, but very bad teachers. So if you have a hyper intelligent AI who understands everything and can personalize the way in which you learn and resolve your doubts and meet you over there that could really change the game for education okay. so that uh, th that same level of personalization can be applied to so many things like healthcare and uh, so many business problems so that's the bull case for ai where it can actually um, revolutionize productivity and uh, personalization in so many spaces of course the worst case is uh, i don't even need to spell it out but <laughs> there's a lot of existential risk attached to it and i really don't know how to uh, uh, give a practical answer to what will happen, like I said earlier. But yeah, the, the extreme case is also that it leads to displacement and you know meaninglessness because uh, some uh, economists have argued that you know when these AI uh, tools create new jobs, those new jobs will typically be in much more niche areas, right? Maybe like cybersecurity or data science. Uh, and it's not like a cab driver can reskill himself to become a cybersecurity expert, right? So that displacement that will be created might just be for in a way that for the first time in history there are new jobs but not everyone can do those jobs only that select one percent can do those jobs so the worst case is that extreme inequality more job loss more meaninglessness and the extreme worst case is of course existential risk let's discuss some of the best people that you've worked with or the brands that you worked with that you still remember because clients at the end of the day are people who pay you right uh, and a lot of times what happens is uh, you work for them but then there is not much satisfaction that you drive back home. But in your case, what are those cases that you still remember, that you still cherish, that you still feel that was an important part of building manualism? Right. So one case study which I would definitely talk about and we've written about this in our book also is the entire digital transformation exercise that we did with Tata AIG. Uh, so of course it's one of the biggest insurance companies in India. and. They wanted to revamp their entire digital presence, their web app, mobile app, all of it. And uh, they wanted to be very new age uh, when compared to companies like Aqua and Digit, which are, you know, heavily... New age itself. New age and heavily venture funded. And, you know, they are attracting all the younger audiences. Yeah. So uh, what we managed to do was to create, uh, you know, using the principles of minimalism, a very new age, neomorphic design style. So now if you see Tata AIG's website or app, it's very simple, very minimal, uh, you know, uses the neomorphic illustrations and uh, the journey time has reduced so drastically that within one minute you can just get a quote and start doing business with them. So this is a total game changer both from a UX point of view because now you are enabling much higher rates of business and reducing customer drop offs but even from a design point of view, it was really heartening to see that a large legacy corporation had adopted this new age minimalistic approach. and. That won multiple awards for you know best uh, UX, best QI in the insurance category in the BFSI space, and that was I mean beyond the awards, the results were evident in the business itself, which uh, immediately grew up in terms of sales volume, and and that case study was really uh, a big one because everyone in the industry took notice and everyone re started reaching out to us saying that this is the gold standard and this is what we also want to do. In fact. Clients in a different meetings started telling that, you know, build something like that, uh, right. that thing. And without knowing that we only were the ones who had built the Tata AIG digital transformation. How important is minimalism or practice of minimalism in today's day and world or in today's day and age where everything is in excess, right? People start their day with their mobile phones scrolling through the Instagram or the Facebook or the LinkedIn pages and end their day with that, right? And there is no space for uh, you know sitting yourself down and doing things and decluttering your uh, mind or the workspace. So how important is uh, this aspect, whether it's studying or whether you're working, to be a regular affair in your opinion? It's extremely critical. And one one particular book that actually deeply inspired me is called Digital Minimalism, which I read at the end of 2019, just before COVID started. And I'm glad I read it and I would strongly recommend it to everyone watching this. Uh, is because it actually teaches one on uh, you know, about the value of having a decluttered life, about focusing on what truly matters and more importantly, moving away from this you know distraction that the digital world offers us 24-7. 
and that is actually very damaging and i remember that after reading that book i my relationship with my devices changed completely i actually started using my phone much much lesser i started shifting a lot of the things that i do on the phone to doing them on my laptop to the extent that it would appear very much like i am from the 80s or 70s because i even started doing my net banking on on the laptop and uh, you know i mean it's it's because uh, i strongly believe that these uh, technologies while they are very good they're also designed to sort of distract you and extract as much of your attention and money as they can so every person has to actually wage war against this you know distracted uh, co- distraction complex that we are up against and and that's why i strongly believe that minimalism should be a key part of every person's life strategy also then there are a lot of good resources that i would recommend uh, one being the book digital minimalism and another being uh, the book called deep work by the same author i think the, those are extremely critical and i believe that those who actually adopt these principles will get much ahead of those who don't okay sail uh, talking about resources what are your go to resources that you refer to again and again what would you suggest beyond books also i consult a lot of other sources like podcasts such as this one long form articles lectures by professors videos and all of that and i actually try to take notes every day and write one article every week on topics like business history philosophy technology economics finance and i do it on my newsletter learning machine so if people want to have this multidisciplinary learning mindset where they want to learn from every different possible field uh, all the time and get smarter every week of course that's one learning resource i would recommend which is learning machine and my idea behind starting this was also that i wanted so i am building this learning machine by consulting so many sources and constantly updating my world view and this is one part of someone else's learning machine that they read this newsletter and this is just one part of 100 other things that they can learn from but i would definitely recommend that beyond such newsletters people really get into books because books are timeless uh, i mean there there's wisdom written in books maybe 2000 years ago which is still so relevant today because human nature hasn't changed it's the same and there are insights from even science and technology which were written hundreds of years ago which are still the same there are very good long form podcasts and i strongly believe that people should watch long form rather than watching 5 minute or 1 minute bites because real learning only happens through long form you know you have to get into the weeds you have to get into the depth of it uh you know th- there is no shortcut in life you know how you have to do the work so either you have to read long form articles or get into long form podcasts or read books write about it and i think that will help you learn a lot yeah three books and three podcasts that you regularly listen to or read right so books that i really would recommend uh one is uh, one book kept over here it's called the sovereign individual it's a mind blowing book written in the 90s uh, i think everyone should read it especially in an era when um you know the nature of money itself is changing the state maybe the role of the state and the nation itself is changing this is a book on how individuals can empower themselves in a modern day digital economy that's that's an excellent book recommendation uh, second would would be so i am a lot into indian history also so i read uh, the anarchy which was an analysis of the era from 1600 to 1800 and how the east india company actually yeah captured Uh, slowly captured the country so that was an excellent book i also read a biography of shivaji recently so uh, one book i for sure would recommend all your viewers is influence the psychology of persuasion because this is this is a book that i had read, uh, read long back uh, probably when i was just starting the company and i believe that everyone in the business world should know how influence works how what are the strategies with which people get influenced and how are those psychological principles so relevant in everyday life as well as in business and work so influence is one book and there's another called behave uh, the biology of our best and worst behaviors so there's so much uh, fascinating research into why we act the way we act what are our core motivations and if people get into it it helps them not not just in life but also navigating tough situations at work right wow lovely uh you books remind me that you also have co-authored a book along with chirag what is that book about tell us a little bit about the kind of learning that you have poured in in that book and why is that going to be helpful for a millennial uh, right. right now so the book that we wrote is called think like the minimalist and uh, it's about the art and science of creating thought provoking design but it all, it's not just about design it's about the entire concept of minimalism and how we used it uh, in in building content or design or advertising but how it can be applied in various fields right and uh, the reason we did it is because we feel that this approach is very very unique and fresh and it can deliver results 
इन अ वेरी टाइमलेस वे सो यू नो ट्रेंड्स एंड फैड्स में कम एंड गो बट स्टिकिंग टू द बेसिक्स एंड कमिंग आउट टू द कोर एसेंस ऑफ अ पर्टिकुलर कम्युनिकेशन एंड डिलीवरिंग इट हैज बीन द प्रिंसिपल फॉर थाउजेंड्स ऑफ इयर्स सो इवन इफ यू रिमेंबर कोर्ट्स यू वुड रिमेंबर जस्ट दोज वन लाइनर्स विच और मे बी दोज फोर वर्ड्स विच समराइज सो मच in those four in fact even in the in in our indian knowledge traditions like in mahabharat or the vedas there are so many like vasudeva kutumbakam just in two words they have some you can write entire books on it but they have just in two words summarized so sanskrit also follows maybe the principles of minimalism in those quotes where you can say so much by saying so little and we believe that that is the ultimate form of sophistication and that's a very critical skill that people should learn you know in a world where nobody has time because they are always distracted or busy you have to deliver your message in the shortest and most concise way possible so those are the techniques and principles that we have captured in the book and they are relevant not just for marketers or brand managers or you know product designers but also for founders and creators and uh, people who are entering the professional world what can a student who is looking at this podcast or watching you or listening uh, to your story can learn from your story right so there's a uh, lot of things but i would definitely say that uh, lot of things in life just happen so you know students typically tend to put a lot of pressure on themselves and feel really bad when an outcome that they have dreamed of uh, doesn't materialize so one uh, learning is surely that you know let just let let things happen and you can only focus on your efforts and let the outcome be whatever it is because truly you don't control your outcome there's so many times in our journey that we have felt that oh we could have done so much better but then i look back and realize but what has happened is already so 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 fortunate that i am really not in a position to complain and say that oh maybe this part could have been better or we could have done that particular thing better or we could have grown a 10x more than what we are today so i think for students it's, it's essential to focus on the process and what they are putting in in terms of their effort and dedication and let the outcome just flow lovely what was your dream when you were getting into the doors of iit bombay i <laughs> i don't really remember but probably it would be to you know really become a successful engineer i i really can't recall my dream in my life was to just enter an iit and when i got into iit bombay that was probably the most significant day of my life because it felt like i had achieved some ultimate uh, goal in life so i don't really recall what my goal was when i entered iit of course i had a lot of excitement about what this new world of engineering would be uh, but yeah maybe it would have been to become a successful engineer uh, honestly the pro- today people are much uh, more connected and aware of the possibilities and maybe today what a 17 year old would know is dramatically different from what a 17 year old would know back in 2011 uh, since we didn't read all the time and we didn't watch reels all day maybe the exposure was also lesser so maybe there were not very concrete ideas of an end goal and probably that also helped in right uh, the journey that we ultimately ended up and hence the minimalist route that you have taken yeah. <laughs> right what are the kind of skills do you uh, peg that a student who is listening to this should uh, acquire in themselves to be successful in at the most general level clear thinking i think clear thinking and first principles thinking in any field that you are getting into understanding the origin and his history of that field why things are done a certain way and what could be the new ways of doing it so understanding things and grasping them at the fundamental level i think is the most critical skill because let's say when you enter any industry and you start following the norms of those industry industries then you are just following what has been done always and what might not be relevant in a world that's very different from the world when those practices came up so to be able to question certain practices you need to have a perspective on the origins on the history and also the fundamental reasons why anything is done if you don't have that perspective you won't be able to question and you'll just go with the flow and it, you know entrepreneurs are the ones who question the status quo and they find out that there's a problem and there can be a solution that's much better than the existing solutions by doing things that nobody has ever dared to do or maybe has considered crazy or impossible right now every person need not be an entrepreneur but they can apply the same thinking in their own work by doing things that nobody thought Uh, were possible or could be done and that begins by questioning and to question you have to be a fundamental thinker to be a first principles thinker which is why i keep coming back to the fact that you have to read 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 keep reading keep learning there's no other answer 
Wow, lovely. And what can be a better ending than this? Yeah. Than to keep reading, to finding the answers. And if you found a few of those answers, do tell us in the comments below. Uh, do tell us how you like this particular episode uh, as we draw close to this particular episode of Conversations Cafe podcast. Thank you very much, Sahil, for coming here and sharing your journey and telling us about so many beautiful things and the importance of being mindful and keep reading to achieve success that we all strive for. Thank you very much once again for making this podcast very special and I hope that Minimalist becomes as big as you probably have dreamt of or as minimal as you probably have thought of. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.